Scott Audubon, Miles, our Vice President, State Fair Secretary, Treasurer. I'm happy to report that we turned in our annual report this year to National and got $114 for doing that. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so out for Ellie. So are we going out? Perhaps <laughs> <laughs> we should do. We'll save it for whatever we need on a rainy day. But um, tonight we have Milo and Charlotte taking a talk on the bear, uh, their bear research. But before we do that, Milo's going to ask about bird sightings. And I guess I'll get the first bird sighting. Yes. It might not be a new one, but three starlings, European starlings. They were in my yard two days in a row. I know. We got them for the Christmas bird count. Now we can get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure what the rule was. Is, are we allowed to get rid of them? Yeah. They're non game. They are non game. <laughs> They're not. They're considered invasive. Are they invasive? Okay, so if you should so choose. <laughs> there, there is uh, um, a uh, no firearm or what's the. No shooting in city limits. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know how you get around that. BB guns? Slingshot. Yes. Slingshot. Yes. Slingshot. There you go. Traps. Live traps. So, yeah. Cast net. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed I looked them up in uh, Islam's book. Islam's in Heslon. They are, they were, he was seeing them back when he was around. Really? And uh, we, in the city of In Peter's, the Islam Kessel book, yeah. Or it's a principal sound. The first winter I was here, or second, so 2001 or 2002, we had. Six, uh, and they dwindled away. I don't know what happened, uh, mm -hmm. but we had a few around, and they hung around near the fishing game building. Uh, it was a common place to see. Them. Yeah, well, yeah. Islam says they're rare, and they're usually seen with northwest crows, and that's just what I saw them with the camp, northwest crows. So, so, anyways, that's my sighting. So, go ahead, Milo. You can lead us on this. Anybody else with good bird sightings lately? Yeah. Someone blow by my window sideways. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, when we were coming back from the back, Milo was in a truck about a couple miles ahead of me. He called me and said there was a puck owl on the other side of the road at 16 miles. And he saw that, but right like 100 yards past that, a Merlin came across the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw the nine owl <coughs> puck owl. Oh, he did. You have to speak up, Dana. Sorry. Yeah. I saw the nine mile puck owl about. This afternoon, you know, right uh, perched on the side of the road. And then about 20 minutes ago, coming in here, I saw the two screech owls. Oh, what? Uh, on um, the, the path? Or? Yeah. I heard a call the other night, a male and female, mm -hmm. right off the trail, and tonight they were both fishing. Well, yeah. and this is the time of year, right? When they start the, This is the start of mating season. Yeah. 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 Trout, mm -hmm. storm. Is it a full moon tonight? Yep. Yeah. Snow moon. Yeah. For those that want to see hawk owls, there's one very regular bird right around the nine mile marker, plus or minus a half mile, or, or maybe almost the next mile. But uh, that's been a very regular bird. There's one about halfway off the Alleghanic Road that's been regular, and then this one that we saw at 15 mile right across from Square Pond is the first time I've seen it, but usually they they hang around those areas. And the nine miles typically on the north side of the road? Both. Both sides? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, one other thing, if there's no other bird sightings, I wanted to mention was that um, next month uh, our speaker is either going to be uh, Drew Lindau on Midway Island or Mark Carroll on Indonesia, diving underwater, diving in Indonesia. He's got a lot of footage. So it'll be one or the other. <laughs> so. Milo, Charlie. Um, I'm going to do the speaking tonight, uh, but Charlotte's right here, and I'm sure she'll chime in uh, when she catches me screwing up, and uh, <laughs> we're both available to answer questions, and this is a joint project. It's 50-50 Forest Service and Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and uh, it's been our passion and our drain of time these last few years, um, and, and all, yeah, we, we've just loved it, but it's been a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears uh, going into where we are so far. So I'll give a presentation. It's more of a slideshow than heavy with data because we've finished the bulk of our field work, but our callers are active for several more years, and so we won't do our be finishing our analyses in, in, until you know 2021 or 2022. And uh, um, so anyway, it's an ongoing project, and maybe we've done kind of the fun stuff up to now, but uh, I'll report on on that and, and what we're learning so far. 
like I said, is a cooperative project between uh, Fish and Game and uh, uh, Forest Service, the Chugach Forest uh, Subsistence Division. And uh, we chose to do a black bear study for, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, they're a native large mammal in Prince William Sound, and there really aren't that many of them uh, because like deer are introduced and uh, uh, moose on the delta are introduced. Uh, but black bears are native to Prince William Sound. They're important to the ecology. Uh, they're a popular game animal uh, for sport and for subsistence. And uh, they're also sought after for wildlife viewers, ecotour folks like, like Dave and just people that are just out in the Sound uh, love seeing bears at, at any opportunity. So anyway, uh, they're popular and important. Um, but some things changed. They've been in the, in the Sound for a long time. You know, everything was hunky-dory for a long time, but come 2000, uh, there was a major change to Prince William Sound that increased human access, and that was the opening of the Whittier Tunnel uh, to personal vehicles. You know, not, you didn't have to put them on a train anymore. And this graph right here tells the story of what was happening, and uh, what you see is a relatively low or a lower harvest level uh, in the years going up to the opening of the tunnel. Here's the year the tunnel opened. It was already, start, word was getting out that this was a place to be. And it opened in 1999, RY99, June 2000. June 2000? Yeah. So that's RY99? 90, okay. That's Fish and Game's term for the uh, regulatory year. Um, so yeah, so the, the, it actually opened right back here. And uh, the word was getting out, but harvest increased rapidly right after the opening of the tunnel. Uh, I'm not sure what this is here, but it continued to climb. And nobody knows the bear population in Prince William Sound. Nobody knows what the proper harvest level for bears in the Sound is. But a lot of people think that this might be too many. And <laughs> after it reached this level, it started to decline 5% uh, per year. And a little blip right here. But then we had uh, another event that sure seems to have compounded things, and that's snowpocalypse. That's 30 feet of snow in Prince William Sound. And I can just give an anecdotal report. In 2011, in August, before snowpocalypse, I made a trip across the Sound to Unakwik and could see as many as a dozen black bears in some of the bays at one time. I returned the following August with salmon in the streams to the same places and found snow at sea level, patches of snow at sea level, uh, willow still not blooming, and in three days in that area did not see a single black bear. I saw some tracks, but I did not see a single one. So a combination of the late green up, or being trapped in dens, or, or something was really hard on bears. Um, and that's what brought us to where we are now. Um, we were concerned, you know, when, when harvest got to really low levels, uh, we were hearing from everybody in the sound, whether it was hunters, ecotourism, commercial fishermen, uh, people just who have spent a lot of time in the sound. Nobody was seeing the bears that they had seen in the past, and we were concerned about that. So uh, we pooled resources, we brainstormed on how we could get you know a meaningful project off the ground. We uh, tried to uh, work with uh, Fishing Games uh, Research Division but they weren't so interested in working with us, and we negotiated a little bit, and we ended up carving out a niche. And uh, anyway, uh, the reasons for getting the project going is we had the, those resource concerns. Uh, little previous work had been done in the sound. Nothing had been done with modern techniques, and I'll describe that, uh, these, this radio telemetry uh, to you in the, in the program. Um, we were carved out a niche, and Alaska Department of Fish and Game Research Division is interested in a large-scale genetic project in here in Kachemak Bay, where there's also resource concerns, where they want to look at population estimation and relatedness of populations, uh, and we'll be using, doing genetic work with them. But we were carved out a management niche and uh, to look at things that affect day-to-day -day management of bears in the Sound. So with that, with our little niche carved out, uh, we. Uh, you know, drove, wrote up some, some goals, and uh, we, you know, charged at it. Uh, first and foremost is, you know, can we run a meaningful project 
on the ground <coughs> without a large budget, uh, you know, and helicopters to to assist in capture of bears. You know, this was a, a ground-based effort, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a second. Secondly, uh, look at habitat selection, and specifically, uh, look at during the hunting season on both. Uh, uh, Habitat selection and use of shoreline habitats on both lightly hunted and heavily hunted uh, islands. Um, compile home range data that might inform future work and compare habitat selection patterns for populations exposed to different levels of hunting. Uh, those are our primary goals that we uh, set out to investigate. We looked at harvest data <coughs> and picked two areas in western Prince William Sound. Uh, one, Esther Island, that has uh, a low harvest density, or I'm sorry, a high harvest density, is close to Whittier, has a lot of bears, and Night Island, which is a little bit more remote, and for one reason or another, has uh, a lower harvest density. <clears throat> Here's some differences between the two study areas. Um, there are some differences, unfortunately, I guess, you know, just, you know, in addition to the, the harvest density, they are different sizes and uh, the topography is different and they're kind of illustrated in these two pictures on the top is Esther Island. It's kind of more rolling, uh, doesn't have high precipitous peaks um, and Night Island is much larger and has, uh, you know, kind of a crown of, uh, you know, very uh, impressive peaks that run the length of it. Otherwise, you know, uh, they had these two uh, basic differences that, that we wanted to use uh, to investigate. We were only able to pull off this project, though, um, by getting innovative. Um, the way you would, there is no road system that could help us. The this study area is remote and it's limiting you know, what we can do there, even, even with uh, boat access. But without, with, with just a mod modest budget, uh, I realized that I could get trained up, go to Coast Guard class and get my six pack license <coughs> and be able to run our Forest Service vessel and we could use it to work off of, and it's very inexpensive uh, to my project, uh, to our budget. Uh, so we had a very beautiful working platform for very little cost to, to the project, uh, just the way um, the government or the Forest Service works out its fleet costs, uh, they're averaged out. So anyway, we thought that, hey, uh, we could work off of a boat, we could uh, trap on, uh, on foot, you know, hiking onto these islands, we would, uh, with our lean and motivated crew, uh, make an extra effort to get some of our trap sites uh, away off the beach, you know, at least a half mile inland. Our goal was to get about a third of our trap sites that far inland so we could get rid of uh, shoreline biases and, uh, and establish trap sites and, and start working that way. So that's what we did, that was our, our, our plan. So, 1,800 pounds of dog food later, 162 gallons of used cooking oil later, three years, if, if anybody <laughs> dove in the dumpsters and couldn't find donuts uh, in the AC dumpsters for three seasons, this is where they went. And uh, also, uh, yeah, poor Pete. <laughs> and uh, also a lot of red vines, marshmallows, maple frosting uh, went into uh, helping us catch bears. Wow, sweet tooth. <clears throat> yeah, and so what we did, uh, and we consulted people who have done bear research in Alaska and other places and adopted their techniques, brought them out on the project with us, and first uh, established bait sites at representative areas. Uh, this is just Esther Island, uh, and I'm just going to use this to illustrate how we you know, kind of attacked uh, this uh, early on, is we established bait sites. We baited them two weeks before we would start trapping and a week before we started trapping, and then we came out uh, for a 10-day trapping session. And we uh, set out bait sites with dog food in our, our donuts. We set up trail cameras. Uh, there's Charlotte setting up a camera on a tree right there. And we did not know what to expect going into this. We were new to the Western Sound, hadn't spent much time there. Um, we knew there were bears there, but we didn't see very many bears in our initial uh, you know, time spent around the island. And uh, we were hoping some of our bait sites might get set. We were taking bets on how many of the piles of bait might get set the first week. Well, the first time, a week later, when we came back to rebait our bait sites, uh, we found all of them hit, or all but one of them hit. Uh, anyway, th that was encouraging. Right off the bat, uh, we started attracting bears to our sites. 
and these are some of the trail cam pictures. We use tra trail cameras in a lot of different ways. We used them to find out if there are bears in the area, and then later on when we were trapping, we used them to find out if there's bears we want to trap, adults uh, or males, if we were short of males, or if they were just young bears or collared bears that we didn't want to catch. You know, we might pull a trap. So we used uh, trail cameras extensively throughout uh, this And so how project. often were they taking pictures? Um, they're um, motion sensitive, and I have one right here I can pass around. They're motion sensitive, and I have them set up, or we typically have them set up to take a uh, eight shot burst, uh, and then it uh, relaxes or won't take a picture for about 30 seconds. Oh no, sometimes, what well, we mess around with settings. There's a period where they won't take another picture, and then with motion, they'll take another, another burst. We took a lot of pictures. <laughs> and the first session, we had it set way higher. Yeah. And we, were, we had just pictures of bears draped over bait for hours and hours and hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we backed off to a four shot standard in a, in a, in a minute or something, minute or, or 30 second delay. Um, yeah, we got a lot of pictures of bears. I'm just going to give you a taste of a few, uh -huh. some things other than bears. <laughs> this is awesome with a bear and an eagle and ravens in the same frame. This <laughs> one. <laughs> and, uh, and another technique that we ad adopted after a slower trapping success is at our baiting sites, uh, putting our buckets up right off the bat so the bears habituate to them. Uh, our very first baiting sessions, we didn't do that, and I think this might have improved our success later on, or one of the factors. So after two weeks of baiting, we, we hit the ground, um, worked off the tenacious, and we loaded it to the gills. Uh, this shows some of the clutter we're dealing with. I'm sure you can find a sandwich in this picture laying somewhere, barrels of fuel, outboard motor, uh, there's stuff under the floor, you know, our food for four people for 10 days. Um, th this was pushing the limits of what we could carry on this boat to, to pull off this work. Um, we also had fishing games uh, uh, with Boston Whaler and Nova as a shore vessel, a, a shuttle uh, to and from the Tenacious to shore. When we needed to, we would hire Cordova Air uh, to fly. You know, we changed crew members out. Charlotte and I were a constant throughout the project, but we begged and borrowed and uh, rotated uh, other people throughout the project. Uh, we've worked off Dave Janka's boat for baiting trips before. Uh, so we used a lot of resources to make this work. So when we set up, you know, got ready to set trap, trapping, there were two basic uh, snare techniques. Um, I'll start passing this stuff around so you guys can see it. There's a, a trail camera, and this is a snare, and you can start passing that around. So we captured bears using snares, and there were two different uh, trapping <laughs> techniques that we caught the bears with the snares. The first one we were introduced uh, to through a biologist who had um, finished a bear study on Prince of Wales Island, a black bear study on Prince of Wales Island, and he mainly caught his bears with these modified Aldrich uh, M15 bucket sets. And what it is, it's a five gallon bucket mounted to a tree. Um, there's a strong spring, an Aldrich spring on the top that's modified to, to fit on a bucket. The cable's attached to the tree, but you can see a little bit of the cable around the inside of the bucket right there. And there's a trigger on the inside <laughs> And if you look straight inside the bucket, there's our little bait bag that has, in, in a little piece of netting, it has marshmallows wrapped in red vines <laughs> dipped in maple frosting. Oh my God. <laughs> irresistible. And uh, it was semi-irresistible to the bears. At first, it, it started off a little slow, but it, it worked real well for us. And there's the trigger. In the town, they wanted more of that crap. <laughs> <laughs> they reach inside for that bait bag, and they pull that trigger the spring, and it's strong, snaps up and uh, um, catches them by the cable around the, the wrist. Um, and I can show you some captures. I have some separate videos I can show you at the end of the program. <laughs> this is a, a trail cam series of a bear being caught. Uh, so this is a bear uh, looking into our bucket. We initially might have had them a little too high. That might have affected some of our success early on. Um, this bear is checking out the bucket. Starting uh -oh. to reach in. You can see it's got the cable on its paw right now, but it's just pulling on it. Whoops. He's taking a minute to ponder, not too panicked, uh, at least immediately. And in the end, uh, they're caught. Uh, and they're tethered to the tree. Um, we check the traps frequently and, uh, and you know, do everything we can to minimize the, the amount of time that they're held in a snare. But then we approach them on the ground and tranquilize them. And I'll show more of that here coming up. 
So this is a bear that's been caught in a, a, a bucket snare. And the other technique that we adopted, we were introduced to it early on, uh, but uh, a friend of mine that I worked with on a bear project in Montana years ago, who's caught lots and lots of bears, came up and helped us with this technique, and it uh, kind of added to our success in the second half of the project. Um, it's a trail set, and it's the same type of snare, and it's the, uh, a metal spring, but you set it on the ground so they step in it uh, like along a trail. And you can see the uh, trail that right here uh, that we're trying to set, uh, some sticks to help guide where, the bear, where you want the bear to set its paw. That's kind of an art and a science uh, making this work. Uh, here I am uh, making one right there. You can see the spring a little bit. It's hard to see, but I think the arms of the spring are right here and the pan, the trigger pan is right there. And then you camouflage the, the trigger and the finished product looks like this. And with sticks, you kind of guide where you want the bear to step. And uh, anyway, the result is the same. They step in a snare and it snaps around their wrist and, and they're caught. I also wanted to point out that all the sets, the all rich and the bucket sets, every set we made had a radio transmitter attached to it. And you can see the <coughs> wire going up uh, to the spring right here. And when this trap is sprung, uh, um, this magnet is pulled out of the trap transmitter, it's a VHF transmitter, and it goes from a slow pulse to a fast pulse. So we can check these traps remotely, and we did this many times a day. I think our goal was to do it every three or four hours, but I think we did it more often than that, uh, all in an effort to minimize the time that bears were held in snares. And I think the first year, the average time a bear was held in a snare was four hours. I don't know that we've looked at that uh, since then. Um, and uh, we made sure, double check this, that we made a physical visit to every trap every day. And uh, we had to make traps, it was a lot of work. Uh, uh, we had to hike to mountain passes, you know, half mile or more inland on some of the sets. And uh, so it was a chore getting to all the sets. Uh, every day. Did you have, um, set at a time to Seven or eight was a, a good number. We might have been stretched a little thinner than that in the beginning. Um, but towards the end, we, when we got this dialed in, we had traps going all the time, bears and snares basically all the time, and we did not need very many out uh, to keep uh, very You busy. had two snared at the same time when you had to decide which one to go to? We've done that. Oh, yeah, for sure we did. In fact, we've had two bears at the same site at the same time. Oftentimes we had a bucket and an Aldrich at the same site just spread out a little bit. And it, was it just once we had two bears and one at the same well, time? there's one at Audi and there was one at the, the, one at the Otterley, Otterley Camp. Yeah. At least, it, two, at least twice. And then there was and one, one at one night one this summer. At uh, Yeah, At Day least Day three times. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So anyway, this is our, these are our techniques. Now you know all our secrets. <laughs> and this is the result, same result of a bear caught in an Aldrich snare uh, standing up and looking at us. So, uh, we got to the bears as soon as we could, uh, as soon as we knew a bear was in a snare. And the first thing we do is we approach quietly and calmly. We don't want to stress them out any more than, than they already are. And the first thing we need to do is estimate their weight. Because the drug dose, although it's very, uh, um, has, has a lot of uh, margin for error, uh, but it is, the, the doses are based on our estimate of the weight. So we look at the bears, we pool our estimates and, uh, and come up with a weight. We, uh, gauge the drug dose. There's Charlotte uh, measuring up the drugs and putting it in a dart. We use two different techniques to dart bears. At first we were using a, a CO2 powered uh, pistol uh, that propelled a dart, uh, but we um, moved to a jab stick, uh, which worked real well for us towards the end and had like no mechanical failing parts and, and was slick uh, towards the end. But here's Charlotte and Dave Sawfeld uh, mixing up drug dose. There's Charlotte with the dart pistol. This, by the way, is the biggest bear we caught in three years uh, of work. It's a 300 plus pound male that's still out there. It's one of the males on Esther that's beating the odds and is still out, out and about. Uh, beautiful bear, uh, bear. And then the other way we tranquilized him was with a jab stick. And here we are approaching a bear. We're not quite as close as we look. Uh, we're outside of the radius of the snare and I would carry a gun, she would carry the jab stick, and we'd use some distraction and whatever it took to get a good position on, uh, for her to get a jab on the shoulder or the rump. You're focused more on the needle than the bear there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Big consequence to poking my little. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Starting to feel real sleepy. Yeah. Um, th and this is something that I, that I want to uh, mention because I, I think a, a people's attitudes towards bears vary, but I think there's a lot of people who are more afraid of them than they, they need to be. Uh, and, um, <coughs> and, and to be safe in bear country, we teach. You don't want to be complacent. You don't want to be overly afraid. You want to be an, a, an educated and aware. And I think this might help bring that point home. Is we've had we we handled 96 different individual bears, 106 or so captures, uh, different captures, and I would only term one bear, black bear, in a snare as being aggressive. A couple others might have shown a, some very mild aggressive tendencies at first. And then basically they all tried to get away. They were climbing trees, digging holes, sometimes just getting submissive and laying down. So a bear and a snare is not you know, the, the raging terror that you might be. Brown bears would be a different story, but I've also worked a few brown bears and snares, and I have seen one very aggressive one, but I've also seen, in fact, an adult male grizzly dig a hole and hide his head in it in the Rocky Mountains on a project that I, that I worked on. <laughs> So anyway, I think this is an important point uh, that they're even in a cornered in a snare like this. They're they're not necessarily aggressive, especially black bears. So then we went to work. Our drugs kept the animals down for an hour to an hour and a half, and that was plenty of time to get our, our work done. Um, here's a bear that's tranquilized. We put ointment in its eyes uh, so it wouldn't get sticks. Uh, we put a mask over it. Um, we have a pulse ox that we would attach to its tongue so we could monitor the vitals. Uh, in fact, we check pulse, respiration, and blood oxygen with that uh, pulse oximeter. And uh, went to work, and I'll show you what we uh, measured here. So uh, here we are with a bear on the ground. Uh, this one's, uh, we've already put the collar on it. Looks like we might be going for blood, uh, blood sample. But we would monitor vitals. We would measure, uh, we would weigh it on a pole, so we weighed every bear. Uh, we would collect blood, tissue, and hair, and that's to uh, accommodate the genetic work that's coming up in the sound. Uh, that was basically working with the, the Fish and Game Research Branch and, and their project, trying to assist them. Uh, we pull a tooth, which allows us to get a cross, send it to a lab and get cross-section for an accurate age, and uh, take morphological measurements, you know, paw width and length of the bear, length, length of the skull, and, and things like that. Here we are uh, with a bear on the ground. I think I'm sizing a collar right there. Uh, Charlotte's taking notes. Uh, here I am fitting a collar, fighting bugs. And then this was our primary goal with bears, was to get the collar on them. If we had a bear waking up and we hadn't finished, we wanted to make sure the collar was on. Our primary objectives uh, deal with uh, looking at bear movements uh, with uh, these satellite GPS collars. Uh, so anyway, we made sure we got a good fit and put these satellite GPS collars on. These collars are amazing, and uh, I'll pass a couple around. By the way, these are collars that have been worn by bears. Uh, the size of them, I think, surprises people. Uh, I'd have to see what sex uh, these bears were on, but those are collars with size to fit adult bears. Uh, could be either on a female or a male. But uh, these look very much uh, like um, what we, we had to make sure they were under 800 gram. What, what was the, we had a, yeah, I forget the number. Uh, because of the weight of the animal, there was uh, a guideline that we made sure that these collars were, were under uh, as far as protocols and experience from other projects. Um, these things look very much like those strict radio VHF collars that have been put on animals for years and years but their capabilities are, are pretty impressive. So not only do they have a VHF signal, which has to be located with an antenna you know, in person, uh, either from an airplane or on foot, uh, and you triangulate on them to get a location, very difficult here in a remote area, very expensive if you have to pay for airplanes, and the weather here would be extremely limiting in how often you could get up and get flights. Um, but they're also programmable v VHF, so in the summer when we might be using it, we have it on for 12 hours, or eight hours a day, and in the winter, when we don't hardly need it at all, we have it reduced to four hours a day. We, in the future, would probably even modify that a little bit more. So it's programmable VHF, and the package is the same size, basically, as what an old VHF collar would be. 
Um, they collect, now this is all pro programmable, but we have these set to collect GPS locations uh, every five hours, and so we can get up to five a day uh, locations. Um, they also collect temperature twice a day, and this, we could change all this if we wanted to, but these are what we uh, ended up with. Uh, takes a temperature reading twice a day, and it takes activity measurement, whether the animal's moving or sitting still, every five minutes. And this is for the three plus years that, it, that the, they're on the bear. All these things are stored on the collar for the life of the collar on the bear. And we have it set because our priority was the locations to just op uh, upload the location data to a satellite. And every other day I get an email from each bear when they're out and about, when they're hibernating, I don't. And uh, I get a Google Earth file that shows me where this bear has been for the previous two days. And those have accumulated so far to over 44,000 locations, wow. high quality locations that we've collected so far uh, uh, during this project. So how much does collars cost? <clears throat> they cost right around $2,000 each. Um, and uh, they're releasable. They have a, a drop-off mechanism because you don't want the bear to wear it for the rest of its life. Um, we have them programmed and, and they do, the company Telonix does calculations for how long the battery will last given all of the settings that you've chosen and uh, then you choose a drop-off date before the batteries will go out. And uh, our first batch of collars that we put out in the summer of 2016 will drop off this coming fall. In fact, on October 15th, 2019, uh, they will drop off the, what uh, of our original bears are remaining. How did they drop off? It's a little bit of a mystery and I couldn't give you the best description. There, there's a cam that turns and it's spring-loaded and so when a, a thread breaks or something, you know, by an, there's an electronic timing mechanism. In fact, I can reprogram it with my laptop. Uh, and when, when that da calendar date is reached, something causes the thread to break and uh, it, uh, the spring rotates the cam and it, it comes off. Then you um, have to go and, locate the, the cam. Yes, and we'll be looking for volunteers after October 15th, <laughs> 2019. Yeah, how are you going to do it? How are you going to locate them? Um, well, we'll have Jeep. <laughs> Uh, in theory, they'll be on, uh, I'll get computer uh, uh, locations uh, that'll tell us unless they're in a den or a difficult place. Does it beep at all? Does it, it send a signal? And it has a VHF okay. on it, so when we get close, we can home in uh, with our VHF. I did a tag fish thing a few years ago, and we relocated the fish, you know, underwater thing, uh -huh. but we could see the surgical staples, and they reflected our dive lines, oh. so we were like 10 feet from it. Oh yeah, there it is! Yeah. Because there could be several fish, and we had to make sure, that, okay, that's our fish there. Well, we... Only yeah. picked up a couple so far. Charlotte just got finished picking up some moose collars on the Delta that, that drop off by the same mechanism. Uh -huh. um, we put collars with earlier release dates on some growing bears that we didn't feel comfortable collaring for three years. And uh, we picked up the first two and they work perfectly. Uh, it's a pretty amazing technology. And there could be, well, this data, uh, the store on board stuff other than locations, uh, will be on the collar, so that'll be new information for every collar that we retrieve. And there could be additional location data that wasn't uploaded to a satellite on the collars. So, uh, results, and what are we learning so far? This is very early in the project. I described to you that we're only just collecting our data. You know, we've only collected half our data. Uh, we have half or more that we'll collect in the next few years. So we started exploratory analysis uh, we contracted with a, a fish and game biometrician and uh, we're starting to look at uh, some of the, seeing what kind of information we can glean from our, from our data set. Uh, we're looking at the collected data we already have for dis differences in habitat use by sex, by season. Uh, we're looking at their use of shoreline habitats, uh, looking at the best, trying to devise the best ways to look at that. And, uh, oh, we're collecting, uh, winter uh, snow depth data on Esther Island. Uh, that's so we can gauge the severity of winters and snowpacks uh, on, on bears. And uh, we don't have a way to gauge summer conditions. It's unfortunate we don't have a measurement of berry crops, say, uh, after this past year. Does the hatchery year. have some kind of like rain gauge or something in there? There's a snow tell site okay. at the hatchery and we, we have that to draw from in addition to four more our own snow measurement uh, sites on up a ridge to 1,200 feet above the hatchery. Yeah, some gauge. Yeah, but not 
berry production or, or vegetation data. This on the cameras can't pick up berries, huh? <laughs> it's been done before, but we did, we have not tried to yeah, do that. They're too patchy for one thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. So what have we done so far? Uh, you know, one of the goals of the project was to find out if a shore-based, uh, you know, <clears throat> trapping method, a, a boat-based trapping method, uh, would be productive and. Uh, in general, I think we can say yes. Uh, we can do some further analysis to make sure that our sample isn't biased, uh, and we're looking at ways to look at that, but we're super pleased with uh, how our captures went. Uh, we ended up catching uh, 96 different individual bears, excuse me, 48 on each island. Um, we deployed 53 total collars. Um, we've lost a few. And we have a few that have disappeared, and we don't know, you know what happened to them, um, but a small number of those. And we still have uh, around 44 active callers. There's two here that we know on Esther that went offline, but the VHF is still working, and we're planning on replacing those uh, in dens uh, in early April. Um, but anyway, we got a really good sample. We're super pleased on, on how this part went. Um, this shows our bear captures uh, as they went through the, the study. Uh, this is our first trapping trip in June of 2016. This is our second. We, we did two trips, two 10-day trips each summer. So that's 2016, 2017, and 2018. We started on Esther Island and caught, uh, got 25 callers out the first summer. We then moved to Knight, and uh, the first uh, 2017 on Knight, we caught these bears. We wanted to augment that sample right here, so this summer we did one trip on night and finished by uh, another trip on Esther Island. This kind of shows, shows what we were after this summer. Um, these are all the locations of bears that we caught in 2016 on Esther, and this summer we wanted to fill in some of the gaps that where we had not caught bears before. Most notably, uh, we did not catch any bears in Esther Bay or Bay of Isles, as fishermen know it, and we were successful there. Then we moved to the lake and we were able to catch some uh, interior bears uh, off the lake uh, to kind of augment that, that sample. And on Night Island this summer, our goal was the same. Um, in 2017, we caught these bears and these are a pile of their locations, but there were some notable gaps in the coverage and we, we gave up, it's too big for us to have covered the whole thing, so we kind of gave up on the southern half of the island, but we wanted good uh, coverage on the north, and we trapped both this summer in Bay of Isles, and uh, uh, Lower Herring, and Johnson, and we very uh, did a very good job of filling in those gaps to kind of smooth out our, our coverage of both islands. So I told you a little bit about the collars and the number of locations. 68% uh, of the fixes that they get are high quality ones, the kind that we're looking after to do our analyses. Um, we have over 44,000 high quality locations so far. Um, this is just sort of a scatter plot of, of the locations. And I'm gonna show this uh, one more time here in a second. Um, this is the female bears, and these are just the ones we caught in 2016. Um, and it just starts giving a picture of you know, what these bears' home ranges look like, how they live adjacent to each other, and what size, uh, you know, how much country they need to live in. Um, these are the males, and they have uh, bigger and more dispersely used home ranges than the females. There's quite a con uh, contrast there. Do that male swam across that, that bay there, the south end of uh, the island? Uh, could have, yeah. yeah, yeah, very easily could have. Up until Midsummer this year, we had not had any bears leave Esther Island, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, our 2017 trapping results from Esther Island resulted in a scatter of uh, bear locations like this, and uh, there's males and females combined here, but there's a similar pattern, uh, very concise female home ranges here. And then from these locations, we can draw home ranges, and this is a mix of male and female home ranges. Uh, we have uh, uh, some males that have used the entire island, uh, a bear that we caught here, ran down here, and has run up and walked back and forth on the shoreline here, and then came back and den down a here. A younger bear? Uh, that was a younger male. Uh, and then, uh, you know, th this includes the females that you, that you saw also. And same thing, the minimum complex polygons uh, for the bears. Uh, oh, and then the, we have the size for reference. Uh, uh, the 10 versus 49 square kilometers for the males. 
and 12 verse 28 on night for the uh, females. This is incomplete. Uh, we're going to build a much better picture of this over time uh, as we get more time, you know, on on uh, our on these bears. The night island bears are new by comparison to the uh, ones that we've been following for, since 2016 on Esther. I want to bring you back uh, to this map of, of the home ranges, and I just put this up here. Uh, sometimes your original question might not lead to the most interesting answers. You know, we wanted to look at some management questions uh, about the bears' use of shoreline, where they're vulnerable to hunting, and if they avoid shorelines, or if there's a sex difference in using shoreline habitat. Um, but we thought we were getting to know these bears pretty well, and. Uh, we thought there were some really, you know, very, you know, uh, consistent patterns uh, in the female home ranges, and these are the females that we followed on Esther since 2016, and we were, you know, pretty impressed by how concise and how heavily used uh, their home ranges were. Well, all that changed this summer, uh, and uh, I'll show you some comparisons. So, uh, bear 25, this one that we've nicknamed Moby, uh, our white whale. Um, oh, so in this graph. Uh, in this plot right here, pay attention to the yellow bear. This is the one I'll show you next, uh, Moby. Uh, this bear right here uh, along Esther Passage, and this purple one right here, uh, we call her the West Coast female. Um, pay attention to those uh, home ranges and how they fit uh, with the other bears here. So up until late July this year, um, this bear lived in this home range, and we thought we had her figured out. So. The, so we caught her in the summer of 2016. The remainder of that year, that we, after, after she put, we put the collar on her, all of 2017 and 2018, uh, prior to late July, I, I just grabbed that date, it doesn't apply to all the bears that I'm gonna show you, uh, but that's what their, her home range looked like. After July this year, <laughs> she, she did this. And it left us scratching our heads, you know, late summer this year when we started getting this data and thinking, what the heck, you know, they went outside of what we thought was their universe. Let's look at this West Coast female right here. So this is an adult female, a 210, and these are large uh, adult females. We don't know her age. Um, but again, all our previous data from this bear was this nice, concise uh, home range. But uh, starting late July or early August this year, she was one of our bears, one of our first bears to leave the island. Uh, she swam Esther Passage, uh, it's a small crossing, but she used the mountains uh, to the north of there and she came back uh, afterwards uh, for the fall. Um, she's one whose collar has failed and that we're hoping to replace in the den uh, this spring. And then this is that Esther Passage female. Again, this is an 18 year old female. The other uh, one, Moby, was an old female too. Uh, 205 pounds, uh, this is where we'd seen her the three previous uh, seasons, and then starting late July, early August, she did that. Uh, swam the passage, went almost all the way to Cog Hill Lake. Uh, she did come back uh, to Esther Island in the end, but she spent a lot of time and just went on a walkabout. Um, you know, we can only guess uh, you know, as to what happened, but I think it's real timely, and this is one of those interesting results that, uh, you know, is neat that we stumbled into. We had obvious bear problems in, in town this summer, and I think our radio colored sample helps explain exactly what was going on. The bears were probably starving or having a very hard time finding food, uh, probably because of a berry crop failure, and we have some anecdotal evidence uh, that points, you know, from all over the sound in, in this area, uh, pointing to that direction. So these bears that couldn't find their normal food sources went wandering, and to bring that example closer to home, um, bears all over this landscape were wandering, and they kept bumping into Cordova in their, in their walkabouts, and they found unsecured garbage. And that led to uh, many bears being killed in town, uh, and here's a bear just walking down Main Street. I'm just going to point out some other things that we're learning from our data that I thought you guys might find interesting. Uh, I'm looking at denning data here. So we see when our collars go into a hole, we don't get location. So we can kind of tell when they start to hibernate, and then we can tell when they come out of their dens. So this is data uh, that shows uh, uh, up to this point uh, when our bear, oh, this is for the, for the denning, the, entering the data, it's 2016. No, 2017 and 2018 is, is when they enter the dens uh, for the coming out.
now they're dens. Uh, it's staggered uh, just one direction. <coughs> but uh, the very first dens, uh, bears start to den, and they don't mess around in the fall. They just disappear on us. Uh, you know, they're out wandering, and they don't really mill around uh, near a den as much as they do in the spring. Uh, they just disappear on us uh, for the most part. Uh, the very first bears seem to be going in their dens in late September. This is broken down by week. Um, by the middle of October, about two-thirds of the bears are in dens, and then it's staggered after that with uh, uh, over until mid-November, uh, bears uh, disappearing in their dens, uh, you know, staggered out after that for the following month. Den emergence is a little different, and I'm going to show you uh, two different dates that we're able to track with our uh, telemetry here. The very first bears might start poking their heads out of their dens in late March and early April. Again, this is by week. And uh, it spans all the way till mid-May when bears are popping their, their heads out of dens uh, for the first time. What's interesting is that uh, there's two different phases of them coming out of their dens or, or, or waking up. Um, this is when they go start walking. Uh, it turns out they're spending, uh, on average, close to a couple weeks at their den, uh, sleeping and yawning and stretching and waking up uh, or waiting for the you know food to become available uh, this is uh, when they actually start walking around and so you have till uh, almost June before all the bears are out and, and walking around again about two-thirds of them are out and walking around by the first week of May differences between the sections for that behavior We'll look at that further uh, because of our sample size. We didn't try to break it down at this point in time. Uh, but yeah, we'll, that's something we'll take a look at. Do you have any with cubs so far in your, in your study? That's a difficult piece of information for us to get because our study site is remote. Our bears are wary. They're hard to see from airplanes. We are chipping away through different pieces of evidence, uh, who has cubs and when. But uh, that'll be a difficult data set to build uh, completely. Uh, we're trying that by putting cameras at dens like this one, uh, so we can tell if, if the females emerge with cubs or not. That's one of the tools, but it's hard to get to dens. Uh, this is what the bears are doing for two weeks or so. Uh, this is a bear sleeping in front of its den. There's the den hole right there. Uh, well, she's been in the news lately, unfortunately. And that's the snow on the ground too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. This is the one that was poached the following spring. Uh, this is the large female that we caught on, on yesterday. But we are doing some den work and we have a couple different goals uh, for, for doing this. Uh, first of all, um, we're placing trail cameras to try to document uh, uh, cub production and to get accurate locations on dens. Uh, so that's some of the work we're doing and uh, we got five, I think, de cameras out in, in the 2017. This past spring, we had four failed collars or some collars that we wanted to check the fit on. And uh, we went into the dens of four or five bears, but we replaced the collars of four. And uh, anyway, uh, and, and set out a couple of cameras, uh, one, of, one, of, one of which has become infamous. And uh, we have plans for uh, two, uh, to replace uh, collars on two bears. Can you swap the collars yeah. out without waking them up? No. Okay, you, you put some drugs in the first? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've done that before. It's going to make this go away. Can you do the main menu? Is it? Mm -hmm. On the Delsa? Bottom, okay. Yeah. There's that. <laughs> Where's Escape? Anyway, dens are hard work to get to, and so we would love to visit all the dens, and if our study area was closer to us, uh, we might be able to do that or enlist you guys to help us with that, but it's remote, it's difficult to get to, and you know, snowshoeing and skiing and bushwhacking, uh, anyway, they're difficult to get to, but we have plans to replace collars in two dens uh, this coming spring in early April. 
Uh, the way we do it is, you know, we have, a, they don't leave a perfect trail for where they, they disappear in the fall. As I said, they kind of just they seem to dive in. Um, but we sometimes have a decent idea. Sometimes we can fly and narrow that down by, you know, through the VHF signal. But eventually on the ground, we have to hike up with the VHF antenna and, and narrow down where the, the den is. And so this is the den work that we did last April. Uh, I'll give you some ideas of what dens look like. Uh, so far, what we've seen on Esther Island is they're in caves or under rocks. Uh, uh, we haven't seen them associated with timber or you know, old growth trees or, or fallen trees yet. Uh, we've seen maybe 10 or 12 dens, uh, something like that so far. Uh, there's a bear inside a, of this crack. Uh, this is kind of an unconventional one right here. We stood in this area for an hour at least before we found uh, this bear in its den, looking at different holes nearby. It's, it's more difficult than you might think. Uh, this is a bear that's in a, a cave type den. There is a tree growing on one side, but this one made a hard turn. You'll see Charlotte Lane in this one in a second. Um, this is one that's been used twice. Uh, uh, bears hibernated in, in it and emerged uh, in the spring and with, with three little cubs. And the following fall, actually, when we took this picture uh, at the end of September or early October, I forget what the date was exactly, uh, another female, in fact, the one who swam Esther Passage and went all the way up to Coghill, uh, she was already in this den in late September. And so she's in there with her cubs, uh, yearling cubs, right now uh, at this point. And this is Charlotte uh, next to another den entrance. Uh, this is in a, a gap in rocks. And uh, this is the den that had the female sleeping in, in front of it. Uh, and uh, they often have broken twigs, uh, like blueberry stems, uh, as bedding inside. And we've even got some pictures of, of a female and her cubs, yearling cubs, raking up moss and bringing it into the den for, for bedding. And so this is what we're, when we place the cameras, what little uh, we're able to do that, uh, hoping to document cub production. Uh, this camera was successful and showed a female emerging with a yearling cub. She's actually sn sniffing though, right? And she's got her snout up like that? Yeah, the, yeah, they probably do that a lot. I don't know, or she sees the camera, but okay. that- Hears it maybe? Huh? It, it makes, makes no noise. Okay. Yeah, it's like a digital- okay. Totally uh, silent. Yeah, it's totally silent. Um, this is a female that emerged. In fact, this is the den we were just standing in front of. Uh, uh, Pedro was standing in front of uh, with the uh, three little cubs uh, coming out of it the previous uh, spring. Here we are doing some of our den work. Uh, this was a den that was in a cave within a cave. And uh, there's Charlotte and I in the back of the den right here. Uh, it, it, it got down to a much smaller space right, right in here, and she was still another eight feet. We were not able to tranquilize uh, this bear. There was a big boulder in the middle of it. In fact, I'll show a picture of her sitting in it. This is Charlotte crawling into a den uh, to tranquilize a bear. Uh, this is like everything your mom told you not to do. <laughs> <laughs> Crawl into dens with a flashlight, uh, and you end up seeing... Yeah, and you end up seeing a face staring at you from about three feet away. They're awake and they're kind of looking, uh, but they're you know relatively groggy, and uh, it, it's totally amazing. And we're following the work of many people who've done a lot of den work. We're, we, we didn't just uh, come up with hatch this idea to you crawl in the den. Cubs too when they're, when um, they're do there's that. only one female that we worked. It was. Uh, the previous one, uh, and we ended up not work working her partly because of the a yearling cub that was in the den with her. Uh, it complicates things when they have uh, cubs, uh, unless they're little tiny cubs, which I'll show you in a sec. This is the one that we were unable to tranquilize. You can't see it here, but there's a yearling cub, uh, but this boulder in the middle of the den made it a little bit difficult. This is the bear. Uh, we just set the camera up, but we peeked in to see if you know, we could see her. There she was curled up there. We go, oh neat, there's a bear in there. We set up the cameras, and from the cameras we deduced she had two yearling cubs in there. We didn't see them when, when we looked in. And uh, there's, she emerged with two. Uh, we're kind of collecting data from all sources as best we can. And uh, a woman who works at the Esther Hatchery has started taking notes and whenever she sees a collared bear. And she ended up seeing this same bear. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different one. But this bear also came to the Esther Hatchery. So this is the same bear here. Uh, in the fall, we saw her at the hatchery uh, eating fish with the two cubs that she emerged with. So they made it through the summer just fine. But uh, another bear, uh, Moby, uh, the one that 
started wandering all over Esther Island. Um, we documented her as having Cubs of the Year this year um, because of uh, some, a report from somebody, and we can match up the report with our uh, telemetry data to know who it was that she saw with Cubs. So from any of you who are out and about in the sound, any report of a collared bear that you see is important to us. Um, if it has Cubs, it's great information, but if it doesn't, that's also good information, because if it's a female and we can uh, assign a female to have been in the area at the date and time that you saw it, we can say, hey, this female didn't have cubs uh, this year. So any reports from you guys would be, uh, would be great. One den that we went to to uh, replace a collar um, had two little cubs in it. I was running the boat and there was nowhere to anchor the boat, so I sat in the boat for five hours while these guys got to play with little cubs. Uh, I'm still having a hard time getting over that one, but just priceless. Uh, these four pound uh, little tiny cubs of the year that were in the den, how, and we how successfully. Old you, how old do you think these are? They're born midwinter, like January. Okay. Now they're being born, so and so this was early April. Gotcha. Yeah. No. And, uh, you know, our, our, our project has made national news uh, twice as different uh, bits of uh, this press release have, have gone public um, when they were prepped, when their charges were filed and when the sentencing took place and the videos are being FOIA'd and will be released imminently um, and it might happen again but uh, anyway it's a very sad story and you've already seen some pictures of the bear and the cubs that were taken were very much like these uh, at that site uh, so anyway kind of a sad uh, discovery of our project but that's Basically, you know what I wanted to present to you. Um, it's been fantastic work. Um, I'm working with a hard charger, Charlotte, and uh, it's been, you know, crazy difficult. You know, with with long hours and a huge task that we're being charged with. But it's been incredibly rewarding at the same time. Also, mm -hmm. this is us with a, a, a female we've nicknamed Betty White because she has gray hair, like <laughs> me. Maybe I got a little bit more. But uh, anyway, a beautiful old female there that we have a collar on, and uh, she's still picking. In the future, um, we have, you know, the future work that we have coming in the project is to replace collars as needed. Uh, the very last collars, the last batch of collars that we put out this year will drop off in the fall of 2021. And if we have the opportunity to replace any uh, collars and failed collars with uh, working collars uh, and keep bears going until this date, we'll do that. Uh, we're going to monitor our weather stations, we're going we're to retrieve drop collars, and then we have, we're just entering our phase of exploring data and doing data analysis, and we'll have reports to write. So, I could have a huge long list of acknowledgements, because the number of people that we've tapped to make this happen is huge. Um, I'm going to show you a series of pictures that will describe some of it, but this is just going to get at who we brought in the field with us on our trapping expeditions. There's been baiting trips, you know, you know weather, you know, den checks. Uh, Paul, or, or uh, you know how much I've been gone. Uh, you know, probably, well, 20 days straight on trapping. Uh, you know, for the last, for each of the last three summers, plus our other baiting trips and stuff like that. It's been months uh, away. Uh, but, and, and we've drawn on lots of people. But it's kind of fun. I put together a picture of every field crew that we've had in the field. Uh, and I'll single out a few individuals that we've tapped. Uh, this is Steve Bethune, who worked on the project on Prince of Wales Island uh, and had kind of introduced us to the trapping techniques. This is Dave Saltfeld. He's from the Anchorage office and kind of devised the drug combination and mentored us on the use of dexmedetomidine, uh, a, a drug combination to tranquilize bears. They were out with us on the very first expedition. I won't name names, uh, but uh, Chris Brockman was instrumental and helped. He's trapped lots of bears and was also very helpful to us. Uh, these are more, more, more. You might recognize Andy Morse uh, here. Um, I tapped on an old friend of mine that I worked with on a bear project in uh, Montana uh, and who's worked hundreds of bears. He just retired from uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks this year, Tim Thier, um, he uh, was instrumental in helping us, you know, kind of learn some new techniques for drugging bears and uh, uh, with the Albridge snares. Uh, there's me and my friend Tim. Um, 
here's another crew of ours with our 50th bear, uh, all excited uh, catching 50 bears. Uh, this is on Night Island. And then this moves to this summer right here uh, with law enforcement helping us out. <laughs> Involves some families, more law enforcement help, more family, and draw another uh, help as we can get it. Uh, anyway, it's been a great ride, a lot of work, but uh, I thought I'd end with this one. In fact, I even got Stacy in here. <laughs> Remember that? You'll never forget.